when it comes to D3 football, I think the last couple of weeks, and I think most weeks of the season, start and end in the WIAC, my friend. You know it uh, better than most, Jimmy. We're going to get going here with uh, our selection for the game of the week. Number 20, UW Platteville. They go into number five, UW Lacrosse. Take the win over the Eagles in overtime on a ridiculous play that we talked about uh, with Brant. But 30 to 27, dude. Talk to me about this one. Well, uh, first of all, there are 4,600 people at this ball game. Yeah. I want that to be addressed. So, yeah, always a great environment at uh, Roger Herring Stadium for lacrosse, but they got sent home unhappy in this one. Uh, shocking loss for lacrosse. Uh, uh, they were probably picked to win the WIAC this year, and now, obviously, Plyville comes in there with a stellar performance. I mean, offensively, defensively, everything you want to name it. Like, they played an unbelievable ball game. Coming out in overtime with the double pass to win it in overtime. Oh, man. Like, that's – there's no better way to win a game on a trick play. That's that's unbelievable. Like, the, that's probably one of the biggest – one of the biggest wins in program history. I mean, I'd have to go yeah. back and look historically. But, like, on the road at lacrosse, like, they're eight-and-a-half-point underdogs, too, by the way, on the Hanson ratings, too. So, that's yep. a huge win. Huge win. Which I actually thought would have probably been more. Like going on the road with uh, a Platteville defense that we know has shown up and traveled incredibly well, but uh, an offense, not to say that we didn't expect a lot from, but we just, we didn't maybe know exactly what we'd get in this kind of top ranked matchup. The defense started things off incredibly hot. You talk about seeing some stops here in the first quarter, both teams combined for like 60 yards of total offense. It was not a great offensive start, largely in part to turnovers like this, a fumble that ends up giving UWL uh, some really great field position in the first quarter. But uh, at the end of the, the first half, man, the cross leads seven to three. This ball game was nothing ridiculous. And there's an interception in the end zone. And you had turnovers back and forth in the first half. And I think both these teams settled down. And, uh, you know, Wisconsin Platteville, I think, was just one of the teams that they were the last one standing and got the last punch in. It was just a matter of who would have the ball last. Yeah, we, yeah, we saw that in this one. Who gets the ball last kind of a game? You know, we see a lot of those in the WAC, especially with lacrosse, that dynamic offense. Uh, and I, you know, coming t- t- touching on Platteville though, Michael Priami, 358 yards and three touchdowns against, yep. you know, a uh, pretty strong uh, defensive backfield for lacrosse. And then, you know, as, uh, lacrosse also, you know, two splitting two quarterbacks, saw that in that one. Uh, yep. Haas yeah. and Weir. Man, man, oh man, that's interesting. But, uh, and they've done quite a bit of that. It's not the first time that they've done kind of uh, that two quarterback type system. I think we've actually come to kind of expect that out of them at this point. Even when you go back and you have a guy like Kaiser Helzerbrand running things there uh, a year ago, and there were still times that he came out of the game because you have a guy that uh, bears a lot of the blows on those on those running plays. So to bring in uh, some help from him, whether it's just passing the ball or just to take a couple plays off, sometimes those guys need that rest. So I think we've kind of come to expect that from this UWL offense. And there's some really good teams in the D2 level you look at Grand Valley's done a little bit Ferris State does it a lot especially when Carson Golker is healthy in kind of the Midwest area that run a similar style when it comes to a two quarterback system the old adage of if you have two quarterbacks you have none maybe not so much the case in today's college football world but uh if your team's good enough I suppose you can make just about anything work oh absolutely 100 percent. in terms of like you got a good enough team it's not really Obviously, it matters who's playing quarterback, but you have you have a really good defense. You have a really good old line. Like you're gonna have a good chance. You know, yeah, it's a team game. Team game. Yep, an unappreciated part of this, too, you see a couple of the plays he makes here. Gabe Lynch out of the backfield for this Eagle attack, and we saw him playing in person a year ago, and this guy is dynamic out of the backfield. He's good, obviously, between the tackles, powerful and physical enough. He's not exactly a bruiser type of running back, but powerful and physical enough to break some tackles inside the box. He had 24 carries for 120 yards, two touchdowns on the day, but also elusive enough, once again, to get out in space. We saw a little bit earlier, you pitch him a little straight, screen pass he puts a man on the ground makes another one fall to the ground and he's got a good combination and a good skill set for that offensive backfield for lacrosse that I don't think maybe is complimented uh quite enough so uh big time plays for him in this one I think certainly was highlighted and then you talk about Brant dude seven catches 189 two touchdowns have a fucking day yeah and obviously the toss too I mean just pop it off with that man holy cow yeah that is awesome. And again, Jack Studer, still not a bad day. Four catches, 74 yards. But for him, we've come to expect a lot more from him offensively, haven't we? 
Yeah, but, you know, I mean, sometimes you get greedy. You know, you can't always expect a guy to score every single week, you know. So, you know, you got to have other guys contribute at times. And, uh, you know, as good as he is, you know, if you you have a high high safety on him the whole game, you know, I mean, it's going to be tough. You have two guys on him, so. Yeah, especially when you talk about uh, trying to take some of those shots down the field, depending on uh, what that defensive secondary looks like uh, and what kind of looks Platteville we're giving them. And, and again, I think it's underappreciated, too. These are two teams that are incredibly familiar with each other, that see each other year in and year out. This is not the first time this Platteville team has had to uh, get up and get ready for this lacrosse offense, or even Jack Studer, for that matter, right? They're familiar with playing these guys. But we'll move over to a game that had quite a bit more people in attendance, Jimmy, by quite a bit more. I mean, 21,000 uh, plus down in yeah, Perkins uh, for this Whitewater Oshkosh game that breaks a D3 on campus record for say, most yeah. people in attendance. Insane. Whitewater ends up pulling this one out. 21 14. The Warhawks take the victory, my friend. Yeah, I know. I was just about to say, you know, 21,000 people for a Division three game. I is, can't even wrap my head around that. It, it's a dream for us come true, Kobe. You know, the, the Division One rejects get twenty one thousand people. So, and by the way, Division One rejects isn't just us; it's all it's the whole non Division One community. I want that to be said as well. Uh, we're all Division One rejects together, I believe. So, um, you know, kind oh, of I hear you. yeah, and it's not something yeah. like we're not trying yeah. to like put that name onto people, right? It came exactly. from like no. you know what I mean. Yeah. You, you kind of interpret it as you may, but. You talk about D1 rejects, man. That's a lot of people showing up for small school football. I absolutely love it. That place and atmosphere had to have been electric. And you, you know, it's crazy too. All those people there on a great UW Whitewater team that we've talked about. They didn't start off incredibly hot, Jim. This Oshkosh team drives right down the field and scores in the first quarter. Had some really good things going for them. It wasn't like UWW had this thing rolling from the jump. And they had a lot of great offensive plays, don't get me wrong. But uh, this Oshkosh, Oshkosh squad, excuse me, showed up and kind of punched them in the mouth. They lead 7 nothing after the first quarter. But a sign of a really good team, dude, is Whitewater to bounce back, score twice in the second, and actually go into halftime leading by a score. Yeah, man. Uh, I uh, there's one there's one play in particular from that game I saw. There's a clip. It was Oshkosh was driving, and uh, there's this huge like uh, this guy broke a few tackles. This guy, the Oshkosh tight end, broke a few tackles, and I think it was a safety or someone just flew out of nowhere and just popped him, and the ball flew on. Uh, Went water recover the ball, and Oshkosh was driving too, and that kid made a heck of a play too before he fumbled as well. I want to mention that, but uh, you know, a few a few huge plays in that game. Uh, you know, and obviously that was one I wanted to mention. So, yep, there's the first touchdown for Whitewater. That's Drake Martin plunging that one into the end zone there for the Warhawks. They'd even things up into the second quarter, got things going even more. Oshkosh did not go down quietly, though, still making big time plays offensively. But, um, Oshkosh wouldn't score again until the fourth quarter, and, and that's where Whitewater kind of pulled this one away. When you look at kind of some of the breakdown here. The attack for Oshkosh, if you've if you noticed here, if you're watching on YouTube, was all through the air. They had almost no rushing attack, nine yards total on the ground when it came to this Titan attack. And it's not something that maybe should be incredibly surprising. It's just kind of the team that we've come to see from this Titan squad. They haven't been a ground-focused team, but nine yards. That's like to the extreme of like a Minnesota Moorhead at the D2 level of a team that literally just does not run the football that is a big-time play down the sideline for Whitewater. They made a couple of those. Uh, through the air, Oshkosh did substantially better, but at the end of the day, just wasn't enough to overcome this Whitewater squad. An interception and a lot of a difference in time of possession. I think that was a big piece, too. 37 minutes to 23. That's what you can afford when you run the Brock efficiently, and uh, Whitewater certainly did that. So... Other than that, four sacks for Whitewater, too. That's something that certainly comes into play here. But, uh, you know, this Whitewater team, I think, was on fraud watch after the UMHB snafu is a nice way of saying it. Three interceptions returned for touchdowns in the first three drives. I think it's safe to say they're still a very competent football team. Yeah. Yeah. When, uh, we're going to find out firsthand here coming up this week, so. Yeah, there you go. I was going to say that should be coming down, uh, coming right down the pipeline. So uh, that one not in Perkins Stadium, though, correct? Nope, right here. So that's uh, that's about twenty one thousand reasons that uh, is probably a good thing because that is uh, that'd be a wild place 
to go out uh, and, and compete in. But let's move over to uh, another top 25 matchup, which we had a lot of this week. We were spoiled. We were spoiled. On the yep. D3 slate, Jinx. man. Jinx, you owe me a soda. And uh, let's go over and talk about Harden Simmons, number seven, taking on number 12, Endicott. And uh, also a big shout-out to the D3 Zone once again for cutting up these highlights for us so we can play them and talk about these games on the show. Really do appreciate you for doing that. But let's Shout talk out. about the Cowboys. And, and this Cowboys team is one that is finally getting some of the national recognition that uh, I think they deserve. And you know, going by the AFCA polls, it's number nine, Endicott, and number eight, Harden Simmons. So this really is a top 10 matchup. Up, uh, in some ways. And this Harden Simmons, this Cowboy offense has been playing at an incredible clip. You beat UMHB last year for the first time in who knows how long. And now it feels like they've taken the driver's seat of the ASC. We're going to find out next week, of course, when these two teams face off. But let's talk about this game with the Seagulls, man. What would you see? Yeah, Harden Simmons, uh, they had 35-minute time of possession and 200 yards on the ground. Uh, I think that was the key in this one. Noah Garcia had himself a day. 126 yards from scrimmage and a touchdown. Uh, Kyle Brown was also super efficient through the air, completing uh, 229 yards at a seven, sorry, 78% clip uh, completion percentage. So, oh, my light went off there. But, uh, but uh, he had himself back. <laughs> This is a heck of a game. See, the computer is not just for my notes. It's also for, like, the lighting for the camera, too. <laughs> it really is. Truthfully, it is. It is. A complex setup over there uh, we've got. But, no, I, th I think you're right. I think that was a, a big piece of it. Noah Garcia kind of being one of the workhorses in this Harden-Simmons offense. You see him here driving down, and it is just run after run after run after run. Try here on the quarterback keeper to get things going across the goal line. Harden-Simmons would have some success early. They scored in the first quarter, went into halftime, tied up at 14 with Endicott, and then just had a little bit of a better second half, to be uh, completely honest. That's the easiest way of looking at it. This is a one score game that certainly could have gone either way. They did better on the ground. Um, didn't maybe average as much per carry, but had a lot more success there. Uh, the punting game was definitely one that actually was pretty impressive for this Endicott squad. But otherwise, you talked about the time possession. 9 of 15 on third down for this Harden-Simmons squad. 3 of 4 in the red zone. Some other big time uh, plays kind of throughout. Had a big time 2 point conversion at one point as well. So just timely plays on both sides of the ball for this Harden-Simmons team. But like I said, dude, UMHB coming up this weekend. Yep, big one, big one, big one. You would imagine with only, what, four teams in that conference right now? Is that what it is? Yeah, I, that four? I think it's that, four, dude. That's weird. I'm pretty sure. Hold on. We're going we're gonna to look at Because, like, I mean, out. with conference real realignments in Division One, I, I wouldn't be surprised. American Southwest Conference right now, my friend. You have Harden-Simmons, Mary Harden-Baylor, Howard Payne and East Texas Baptist. Wow. I, that's it. I feel foolish for not knowing that, but that's a tiny conference. Yeah. And they, <laughs> they've lost pieces. I think that's that's worth noting. Yeah. It hasn't always been that way, but right now it is four. And two of them happen to be pretty solid nationally ranked yeah. football teams, which is a pretty good percentage. 50% of your conference is nationally ranked. But, uh, yeah, four teams in a conference, is, it, their schedule, they're playing almost everyone twice throughout their entire season. Yeah, that's uh, a tough draw for those other teams, man. That's brutal. Yeah. It's pretty bad. But, brutal. Uh, and nonetheless, big time win for the Cowboys. We'll see what they do uh, this coming weekend against Mary Harden Baylor. Let's move forward. A lot more of a one-sided game. Man, these games, dude, these games with North Central playing these quote-unquote top 25 opponents, why does it never feel like they're playing a top 25 dude. opponent? North Central, number one, goes down to number 23, Wheaton. They win for the Bell uh, Trophy 15-5 to 27. In what was really even a more dominant performance than that, Luke Landon puts on another clinic. Talk to me about this one, dude. I mean, North Central ran for 298 yards and seven rushing touchdowns. <laughs> Like, what is that, man? Like That's dominance. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, we didn't put up 27. You know, I mean, they're going to – they scored some points. But, like, man, oh, man, I was – I just – I'm so – I'm just sick of talking about North Central, dude. All they do, they win. They just blow teams out. And, like, I'm just like – that's all I talk about all week. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, they're just so good. Like, I mean, I say that in the most, like, respectful way, too. I mean, I just yes. like – it's the same thing. Like, there's never anything new with them. It's just like, ugh. Like, I want to see someone, like <laughs> – like, 
I want to see someone like challenge him in the regular season, you know, because obviously Corlin took him down last year. But uh, man, oh man, I mean, and then lacrosse played him really tough in that playoff game too. Like, there's yep. definitely teams that can take down North Central. It's just, it's not a matter of that. It's just like they're. Confident. Yeah, you look last year. That lacrosse game was incredible. Yeah. You talk about yeah. the finish against Wartburg in that semifinal. That was an awesome matchup. And then obviously the national championship game with Cortland. There were some great games mixed in there. We saw Luke Lanin run in his first touchdown of the day on a 35 yarder. He had a 53 yarder in the second quarter as well, and then a 15 yarder in the third. This dude was doing it all with both his legs and his arm. How about a touchdown? pass right there for the second score of the day that one to Joe Sacco he has been a constant weapon in that offensive backfield for North Central and as long as these guys are here man there's no way teams right now especially the CCIW are slowing down this offensive attack the way they're able to operate so efficiently and the offensive line unit that you talked about with those rushing stats they're not getting enough credit Luke Lane and obviously does some freaky things on a football field that offensive line is a very big part of that they got up 21-7 at one point it was 41 to 14 uh and really 48 to 14 even before things started to kind of look a little bit better on the scoreboard. But this game, the score isn't even as as dominant of a showing as what it really was, I think. Yeah, I saw uh, – I got Rod, our, a friend of the show, on uh, on Instagram, like his story. And he said he just picked a, took a picture of the scoreboard on Saturday. I'm like, damn, yeah. dude. Like, they're doing it again. I think he said, like, little brother or something, or, like, bring that bell back. I don't oh, know. Oh, boy. So, not a direct quote. I just It was something along those lines. I thought it was funny. Yeah, I think so, it was just bring out. the bell back. Yeah, yeah. not to start any yeah. – not to start yeah. anything there, but oh yeah, it was just something along like some teasing lines. Like, oh yeah, to- which he's gone now. He's graduated and moved on, so he's certainly in a much better position to say those kind of things. You know what I mean? Oh, uh, absolutely. But, yeah, but now this is a game too. Uh, Seeing some discourse on Twitter where this was four the the four of the last five games played, and this is that big time run from Luke Lane. And how about this guy? He's got speed. He's got burners out there, which I don't know why he just. He just turns them on when he wants to, and he did it right there. But this is four out of the last five now for this big-time rivalry game of the CCIW that have actually been played at Wheaton. There's a lot of discourse there of how that has been able to transpire, especially when these two schools, I believe, are under 10 miles from each other. Yeah, not far. Not far away. So the fact that four of the last five have been played on the Thunder's home field is kind of ridiculous and certainly something that will hopefully change. North Central, the Cardinals, will host the game in 2025 that has been released, but 2026 and onward is still TBD. So that's something that feels like they should not be able to get away with, but nonetheless, North Central maybe took that personally and just stacked the chips even higher, which as a number one seed is crazy, but that's just how they operate over there. I don't think it matters where they play. It's 10 miles away. Like North Central's fans can just drive 15 minutes. Like True. But very true, very true. But yeah, like you said, North Central continuing to be dominant, and I think people get on us like whether it's the North Centrals of the world, the Hardings, or the, those kind of teams that are week in week out just blowing out these squads, and it's like, what the hell do you want us to say? They're very good at football, yeah. incredibly good, and we're gonna talk about it when they come and play meaningful games. Like this is a meaningful game still, even though it was a blowout. But until then, there's other football to talk about, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> I don't even know if we should cover them until like they are in the playoffs. So you just like, I don't even care. Like, I'm with you. Uh, some other storylines to close things up in D3 this week. Rochester University remains unbeaten with a 14 to seven win over RPI. It's the they're five and zero for the first time since 1992. Jimmy, that's a big win. I mean, there's been a lot of like. Uh, curse or uh, streak breaking wins over the last few weeks. Uh, there I have. love you know, it's just it, it, there's just there's something in the air. You know, <laughs> maybe in the Upper Peninsula there could be another uh, streak breaking game. We'll see. I mean, it, there's been a lot of them this year. Jimmy, there's been so Jimmy, many. There's Jimmy, been so many. Jimmy, there's been so many. Jimmy, what? I love the cats. I love the cats. I'm repping them oh. tonight. The cats are at Grand Valley this week. 7 p.m. kick homecoming. College football, man. Any given Saturday. <laughs> Any given Saturday, man. I got Except the UP for title. this Saturday. Upper Peninsula. Look. I'm still bro. I'm repping the Cats, too. It's the UP hat. Oh, not to steal the spotlight from this uh, University of Rochester squad. They opened up the year at uh, Olivet, which actually I think was a pretty big statement win for them. 
uh, against, I believe it's the Comets there, 28-21 at MIAA foe. They go on to have some convincing wins over Alfred State, Salve Regina, University of New England, and now RPI in their first game of Liberty League play. And this RPI team's kind of been down and out. Still a very competent football team, I think, is, is very much worth noting. 14-7 to win for them. Now, they're 5-0, and some convincing wins. You're in the Liberty League play now. You're potentially your biggest test yet at Butterfield Stadium this coming weekend, Jimmy, against Ithaca College. So That'll be a big one. Be a big see one how that one. goes. Still have some squads, Buffalo State, Union College, Hobart, that we'll talk about in just a second. Like, there's some games coming down the line. But let's stick right in the Liberty League. Hobart, they take down Ithaca this past week, 16-7. to Defense steps up, holds the Bombers to uh, very little offensive production while well, they didn't take too much on their own end Hobart only actually had one touchdown on the day three field goals gets them to their final score of 16 and uh I think it's kind of crazy too you look at the breakdown of this one Hobart had 250 yards of total offense they only had nine first downs and they end up winning the football game that's wild yeah that is not a lot of first down. that's not a lot of first down. yeah and so uh, a lot of that I think it's just field position, getting the ball in the right spot, finishing with field goals. They were not really able to finish uh, inside of the red zone, but uh, you look at it for Ithaca, interceptions for both Matthew Parker and Colin Schoom, there are two interceptions there. So those are kind of the two field position type deals where they get the ball in good territory and are able to finish with field goals. But for Ithaca, Jalen Leonard Osborne, 25 carries, 144 yards on the ground. That's pretty big time. EJ Taylor on the other side, 99 yards and a touchdown for Hobart who, again, they didn't really do anything through the air, uh, which is crazy because they had 117 yards of total passing, Jimmy, and Ahmad Crowell um, uh, accounted for 91 of those yards on three catches. Wow. Jeez. That's awesome. Uh, that is that is really awesome. A couple standouts defensively, though, for Hobart. Anthony Romano, 16 tackles, and then uh, Diamond Bliss with 14 Romano also had an interception. That was one of the better stat lines in D3 football Damn. this past yeah. week. It's a hell of a game. Yeah, so big-time win for Hobart. How about some MIAA action to close things off? Albion, they beat Adrian 38-27 in that MIAA matchup, and Hope absolutely thumped Trine. Looks like they might run the table for that conference championship this year. Yeah, that's how it's looking. That's how it's looking. Yeah, after that win over Alma and... You kind of assumed maybe trying Albion, Adrian, one of those squads might be one of the last pieces to kind of go over it. If the way they looked against trying, I don't think there's either way one of those A schools even goes the distance with hope this year. Any given Saturday. <laughs> oh, yes, sir, Jim, but I'm excited to, to keep breaking it down, brother. Appreciate you uh, spending some time with me tonight, my man.